calling to order the Thursday, September 12th uh, public hearing of the Northampton Planning Board. Um, it is 7 p.m. The first item on our agenda is a continuation of a special permit with site plan by Benjamin Lewis for 15 residential units and site-related development at 34 Dewey Court, Northampton, map ID 31D-217. Um, the applicant has requested uh, a further continuation of that hearing to October 10th at 7 7 p.m.? Well, I would recommend, there was no request for a particular time. We'll okay. have a couple of their items. Um, I would recommend 8 p.m. Okay, I'm sure everyone okay with that. Yep. So there's a, a requested continuation um, to October 10th at 8 p.m. Um, Yes. Yeah. Yes. I would move that we continue to October 10th at 8 p.m. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Those opposed? It's interesting. If we, we deny the continuance, then we go ahead with the hearing in its absence. We would. That would probably not be in the best interest of just the process. Yeah, <laughs> just a hypothetical. It is a hypothetical, yes. So inconsistent um, with due process, but yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, um, yes. Uh, would you like to vote against it? No, I'll vote for it. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, we did. Yes, so this has There's passed. A so no, there was a second, and we said all the favor. Yeah, we I did explain what just happened. Yes. So. Uh, at the last public hearing, it was a joint public hearing between the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board. The Zoning Board of Appeals made a finding. The Planning Board did not. We continued our hearing. In the interim, there has been discussion among um, the developer and some of the abutters about the project, and there are still negotiations ongoing um, that may or may not result in changes to the application. Um, correct? Uh, we don't know what's going on. They just asked for a continuation. So they have requested a continuation in order to continue on their own moving forward with more information they'll provide to us um, on October 10th. So unfortunately, um, if you are here to weigh in on that project, that is no longer on our um, on our agenda to continue tonight, but we will be continuing it October 10th at 8 p.m. Um, so we can move the other item yes. up to the, what about, can we, can we do this? You can't do it until the schedule time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for folks who are in the room, we do have two other hearings on our agenda. Um, the next one isn't set to begin until 8 p.m. So we cannot open that hearing until 8 p.m. We do have a number of other items of other business for the planning board that we will begin to take care of in this interim 50-ish minutes or so. Um, before we move to that other business, I will ask if there is anybody from the public who has wants to make a comment on an item that is not on our agenda, um, that is unrelated to anything that, uh, that is part of our posted agenda. You are welcome to do so at this time. Otherwise, we'll move on to our other items, um, and we'll start with our a &R. Sure. Um, hold on. So let's see. We have um, Spring Street. This is an urban residential A district at the top of the hill uh, by Chester Mill Road. Uh, so there's. Uh, this is right at the point where Chesterfield Road and Spring Street meet. Um, so right here, there's a large triangular parcel, and there's a house right at the point. They're asking to carve off a, a frontage lot from the Spring Street side, actually, and it, it wraps around as an L shape to the uh, to Westfield Road. So two buildings, two buildings. No, there's an existing house. It's, this would not. I mean, there's a bunch of wetlands over here, oh, okay. so it's really the this area is the buildable oh, portion okay. of that parcel. Yeah. So there's not. Um, it meets the frontage requirements for the Great. URA district. So. I'd make a motion to approve or to endorse the questions, George. Yeah, after the motion, I'll, we'll have a little discussion, I'm sure. A question, Jeff, because I'm still always confused by the A and R. Okay. So, we, do we get to weigh in on the the, uh, the access to that lot? Is it directly opposite the 
from the condominiums, the uh, what are the golf oh, course Fairway Village? Yeah, Fairway Village. Uh, well, number one, you the request for an A&R is not about the location of the access. That would be then become a DPW issue. Uh -huh. um, there's no, there's there are 50 foot offsets from intersecting streets. So, um, but not driveways, not other residential driveways. <coughs> um, and the only issue with access is about the adequacy of the access. So can you actually get to the property from the street? And, and but not necessarily not where the location right. is or what the best sight distance is. <coughs> so since there is frontage, there is no, there's no, have no capability to, to deny this. Right, and there's no, there's direct ability to come right off the street onto the parcel. So therefore, there's not a, there's no um, need for the applicant to create a subdivision in order to access the parcel. So therefore, it's not a subdivision. Therefore, you have to sign off the fact that it's not a subdivision because there's already frontage, and subdivision is about creating frontage. So if there are wetlands on both sides of that parcel then they couldn't apply for the A&R because they wouldn't have access to it. If there were wetlands between the parcel and the road, then no, they'd have to first go to Conservation Commission to get permission to cross, and then that would be proof that they have access from the road, and then they would get the A&R sign. So we have a motion, do we have a second? Mark? Oh. Uh, all those in favor of endorsing A&R on Spring Street? Yes. Anyone opposed? You guys are off for a month, and we have five a.m. <laughs> um, this one is which one? Oh, Baker Hill Road, Lawrence, off of Nonetuck Street. Yeah. Um. Uh. So these are. This is just up from Nonetuck. So. There's not a tech down here. You go up Baker Hill this yeah. way to the top. Mm -hmm. And there's a large parcel here, so they're creating three lots, 75 feet of width um, all together. It actually, there was you mean a. You mean each one? Each, each one is 75 feet uh, okay. wide. Yeah. And this is Baker Hill? Yes. Yeah. Um, and 23,000 square foot lots, so they're quite substantial. Yeah. Motion to endorse for a question. We'll start with some questions. Why are you looking at me? Because you always have questions. I mean, we don't need to have questions. Is this, <laughs> it's is this more positive infill? I guess we can um, call that infill. I mean, right? if we see an it's application of the site plan, we'll know. Yep. It's in the urban residential B district. So, yep. you know, the lot sizes are, requirements are smaller. These are quite large lots. It's just down from well, they're just lot deep. center. They're not wide. Right, right, but um, they're larger than the minimum lot size. Right. Is yeah. it 75 feet actually fairly wide? And I think it's wider than the Yeah, uh, yeah. I, it's um, right for the or core neighborhoods. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty decent width. Yeah. Seven. I have a motion to approve. Would you like to make the motion? The motion to approve the endorsing the NR for non-check. It's all a bigger number. Sorry. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Opposed? Um, just a quick question on process. The uh, so when an A and R comes before us, there's none of those public notice signs that go in those lots, right? No. Nope. It's not an application for development right, yeah. at this time, and, yeah. and it may never be. Right. But I, I'm I'm just wondering about the abutters who then find it because again, this street is a dead end and. I know it can happen. I know yeah. all the legality around. It's just unfortunate that the abutters don't have any kind of um, right. kind of notice about this. All of a sudden, they're going to have three new houses on this very quiet. They may street. not. I mean, yeah. I think yeah. Just like a, just to be clear, the A and R is just yeah. you know it's a it's a map change, right? It's a parcel right. change. Yeah. So it doesn't. It's not saying that there right. will be three new houses. If someone proposes that, there would be extensive public yeah. hearing opportunities for people. Well, not well, for no, a single. No, 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 not for a single. Right, right, right. That's right. That's right. Sorry. Take it back. I take it back. I regret that this is under recorded, but what does A and R stand for? 
approval not required. Okay. And it doesn't A-N-R. Really, okay. A-N-R. Right, right. <laughs> A-N-R. And, and it doesn't right now, approve yeah. Yeah. Right. We're approving we're something that we're approving. Right. 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 Okay. Right. We're endorsing. But it really means subdivision approval is not required, meaning right. you don't have to apply for a full subdivision that creates a new street. Right. It was clear to me what the principle was. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is, there is an interesting point, you know, just in terms of the, you know, the new zoning, and I think it's not really new anymore. It's much older, but you know, I think this is sort of one of those cases where people are in a community or in a neighborhood where there are extremely large lots, and we know that there is now an opportunity to do additional development. You know, maybe yeah, like an opportunity for. City councilors or other folks who are engaging with their constituents and community members to kind of raise that or kind of encourage neighbors to talk to one another. But we can't, there is no legal mandate to do that. So, but. but I'm just talking that through. Say you gave it all the neighbors, all the abutters a heads up, but they can't do it. There's nothing they can, right. That's what I mean. Right. They can't do anything about it. Right. They can right. just know about it before right. they see the plans right. for the house or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, we'll see the real estate signs first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Kennedy Road. So this is um, really, believe it or not, just a bunch of little swaps going around <laughs> on this parcel. So these look like flag lots, but they're actually not. They're just um, really long lots that go all the way back to that. So they're basically swapping property ownership from this side of these three parcels to the other. There's a really funky skinny strip going down here that um, um, doesn't make a lot of sense if you look at the whole grouping of lots. So they're just, basically the end result will be the lots seem more um, uniformly shaped, if that's possible with such a big lot. So it's really not, um, there's no There's no new house development plan, it's really just swapping <coughs> land. Motion to endorse? Uh, I move to endorse the Kennedy Road. A and R. Is there a second? Mark, all those in favor? Yes. Yeah. I'm abstaining. Okay. I'm a next door neighbor and I oh. represented them. That was your, that was your rep? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did a great job. <laughs> so, okay. So. I love these technicalities. So are you abstaining or recusing yourself? Well, he's abstaining from, we're not, it's not a hearing for him to recuse from. Oh, okay. So he's just okay. abstaining from the vote. Okay. She's right. All right, good. Okay, this one I actually put on the agenda, Fair Street is really old ferry. Right. And this is also some swapping of land down, going down towards the fairgrounds. Um, just, um, there's some larger parcels that go back, but it's just this parcel would go over here with this land, this one would go over here. So again, not creating any new lots, just shifting land around. When that happens, it has implications for the water community and all that stuff. Like, probably. Like, were you surveyed and like reassessed at that point? Maybe, yeah. It depends, you know, if, if those lot size goes up, right. then there's a little bit of that, but it's not going to change the overall impervious area. So, um, I don't know what voodoo they do to figure yeah. out what the stormwater bill is, but um, I'll leave that to them. <laughs> Someone like to make a motion to endorse? Make a motion to endorse the in our um, very full room. Is there a second? Second. Mary, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? We only have one more. Moving right along. Okay. And then I have one other item. Oh, there may be two other items. Who would like, who would like this fellow? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is Winslow Avenue. There's an existing home owner, so this is down in Bay State, okay. off of one of those streets in Bay State, <laughs> um, federal. So um, 
It's just a big lot of single family house or carving up another single family house lot. Move to endorse the ANR on Winslow. Mark, is there a second? Sam, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? Yeah. Mark, Sam. Okay, great. So I have, besides minutes, I have one other question for you in the other category. Um, this has to do with lighting at the lumber yard. After they went through the process of installing the lights, um, some one of the inspectors in the building department actually went out with a light meter and measured some of their um, wall packs, and they're a little bit brighter than um, the five foot candles that are the maximum for central business. And so the question is um, well, so it's it yeah. ranges seven to ten foot candles versus the maximum allowed is five. So it's not a huge difference. Um, they put in the lights that you know were approved, and we looked at them at the building code, uh, building level. They didn't have a foot candle measurement. They had lumens, and so I think, I think sort of uh, re um, in retrospect, um, we probably need a better way to translate the lumens into what those foot candles would be. That's so photometric. Was required. Um, yes, and they put so it looked like it. It would. It appeared that it would meet that. It happens that the lumens are slightly higher, so the the translated wattage for the fixture they picked is not the lowest wattage. But there's the building commissioner feels like in between the proposed wattages might like the lower wattage might not be enough light, and then there's it, and then it jumps up. So there's so, a photometric plan. Based on their inference, based on the inference, so what it would, what the yeah. candle would have been. Can't they just swap out the lamps to a lesser output? I don't know if it's that easy, and it's another, it would be another big expense. I think maybe 10 or so of these. Have they, you bring those lights? No, they looked at that. They'd have, to, like, they'd have to rewire to put a dimmer on it. I actually just dealt with this. They have to like, put a global voltage wire to all the stuff. Yeah. So the so question is, the yeah, it just came up in a normal inspection. Right. So the question is, would you want to a uh, would you want to see this as a full blown amendment? Would you want to do an administrative amendment posted, you know, on an agenda so it's clear, you know, what we're reviewing it? Because there is, you do have the ability to amend, um, make minor modifications to the site plan that was approved. So I want to be able to give them back the information whether you would look at it. What would be waiving the requirement? Would be waiving the foot candles? Yeah, that one's being asked to just leave while we're not alone. Basically, to keep it as is. Can I ask? Instead of five going to How did the building department become aware of this problem? Because they said so. It was just a random inspection with a light. So it wasn't a butter saying that they're very distracted. Right. Then just excuse myself of these because I'm part of it. Oh, about it. Ah, okay. Okay. Let me ask you a question. Is it possible <coughs> to wait a little bit? I mean, things like this is was just built, and it could finish the hope. Take another measurement. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just like you know, in the dead of winter, and you know, our, and neighbors, if, and neighbors annoyed, or multiple neighbors are annoyed because you know someone's always annoyed with something. But then I, I, I see a reason to potentially go back and say something. But uh, you know, at this this at this early early I, I But I think oh I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna I'd be inclined to disagree and you'd say, well, seven to ten isn't that much more than five. Ten is twice percentage wise. Five, yeah, percentage wise is well plus I mean and can they get a CO knowing that it's not in compliance with the site plan? Like that they didn't build it according to the format. I think they already got the CO because yeah, it's oh, not yeah, a it's yeah. not okay. CO so thing. But, I, but, but one, I don't, I don't believe without being told by their engineer that swapping out the lamps would be that expensive. Okay. Or maybe it's a light temperature thing. Maybe it's 4,000. It is 3,000. Oh, it is 3? Yeah. Okay. Because that was the thing that we were definitely looking at. And they, yeah. they installed the 3,000 one. So the alternative, I mean, the other thing is, too, we could 
do another measurement because I don't know how you know sometimes they sort of fade a bit uh, I don't know how long that I just was. I still remember I don't know how many years ago that was when we did a field trip outside with the plane board and the light meters yeah. and determining you know gas stations were saying we need 10 yeah. foot candles for safety and then we realized it wasn't for safety it was for marketing because you can read a book by three foot candles or something like that, and so, um, and and so that's always stayed with me. And so I, I you know, I, I'd like to see something on wall packs. It's not an expensive light fixture, um, and so to me, option A would be to switch the lamp. B, option B would be switch the fixture, and C would be leave it as it is. But I'd like to see a good faith effort to do A and B before I would approve C. Okay. So, so in the, if you, do you want them to come back for a formal amendment, or um, if they just go with option C, let's say, or do you want to um, have them come back to you in a posted meeting and describe what they've done to address it? Yeah. So I'm inclined to let the, let the planning office and the building inspector handle that and make the changes, whatever. Yeah, if they swapped out the lamp and, and showed that we, now we meet the foot candles, then I don't think it never needs to get past the okay. yeah. Yeah. Right. But I, yeah, I would be nervous about kind of waving it and just letting them go ahead, because right. that's kind of a bad precedent for right. us to set them. Okay. So um, Marissa, just since you're relatively new to the board, one of the options sometimes when things like this come up is an administrative review, which means that we don't necessarily require a full review of the hearing that gets posted on the agenda and we'll come back, there's a new presentation. It's saying that it's not, it doesn't rise to the level of complexity or seriousness that we need to do that, but that the expertise within the planning office can do that negotiation and kind of move the spirit of the zone. It, it, it might be also an option B.1 where you can, you can, an option could be on a wall pack to, to modify it and it adds like a shroud or a shield so the light still doesn't go that far out. So it's the same fixture, same lamp, it just mm -hmm. doesn't have the ability to like go out. Right. Kind of thing. Okay. So yeah. should they can turn into the art. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay. So then the last thing I had was minutes from August 8th. I'd like to approve the minutes. They were really. to folks who are here, our 7 p.m. hearing uh, on 34 Dewey Court has been continued to October 10th at 8 p.m. We do have an 8 p.m. hearing, which we'll be able to begin in about 32 minutes. Um, we are unable to open that hearing before 8 p.m. Um, and as always, if there is anyone who would like to make a comment to the planning board on an item not on our agenda, you can do so at this time. Um, otherwise, we're going to carry on with some of our other business until we can open up that 8 p.m. hearing. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so for base code, Marissa, I'm not sure if you've been part of this conversation before. No. Okay, so let me just try to give a quick 30 second version. We can fill you in more later. So we have basically, and you, the rest of you all know this, but we have a traditional zoning ordinance. In downtown already, we have a very form based requirements, which is to say we have very little restrictions as to the kind of uses they have downtown, and we care much more about how do the buildings look and how do they function. We've been going through a process slowly to sort of generally make the zone ordinance more form-based. So our downtown regulations are primarily focused on... Excuse me, Wayne. Yeah. Would you back up for a second and explain that again? Because I have honestly never understood the meaning of the term form-based even though I've sat through a couple hours of discussion. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. About it. So, and it's a continuum. So we actually have partially form based. So, oh, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let me do an extreme. Go back 30 years or go to lots of hill towns around here. Zoning regulations spend a lot of time talking about what uses are allowed where, and a lot of time creating a cookbook on a building has to be at least 20 feet back from the street, at least 40 feet back from the street. So it's called, Prescriptive zone. We have a, a specific prescription for what you need. 
and we focus a lot on the uses. And that's true in Northampton for all residential districts. Um, Form-based code to the other extreme is we don't really care what the uses are. We care how does it function for the public. Um, you know, how much traffic is there, but particularly what do the buildings look like. Um, and not necessarily look like in terms of design standard, but you know, is there a continuous facade of the buildings up to the street? Are there lots of windows and doors? Or is it, you know, imagine King Street, which is very different from downtown. Um, so what's the, you know, what's the form of buildings on King Street versus the form of buildings downtown? Um, we have what's traditionally considered a traditional choice, the same sentence. We have a traditional code in most areas where we talk, we focus a lot on uses and a lot of dimensional standards, um, but less so in all of our commercial areas. So downtown, for example, we say you can't have residential within 20 feet of the street because we want to be uses that are really alive. And otherwise, we allow almost any use anywhere in the building, not manufacturing. But for the most part, we allow any use anywhere in the building. And we focus heavily on the design of buildings. We have a minimum height of, is it 20 feet or 30 feet? Um, in the downtown, downtown? Yeah. for CV, yeah. Um, a minimum of 30. Okay, so a minimum of 30 feet because we want some presence. We have a maximum setback of five feet. We have a separate outside of you guys. We have a separate central business architecture committee. So while we have, and we have no, almost no parking regulations stand. Um, so while we have, in our downtown, we have sort of something that is technically a form-based code. Right. We care about the form of the buildings. We don't care so much about the use of the buildings. Um, we still use lots of words to get there, so it's difficult to read. So form-based code is, at its purest, much more focused on the form, so like downtown. And then there's a look and feel form-based code we don't have, which is much more graphic-oriented, much clearer, easier to read out there. Um, so, the other thing about tra our traditional zoning is we always we started on what are the regulations for private buildings? What can I do in the building? And then we have some general language, which you all see as part of site plan approval, which says we <coughs> care about circulation in the area. So if you're building a new building downtown, we're going to require you to rebuild a sidewalk. We're going to require you to put a street tree in front of your buildings. But we don't have to have any standards for that. And so that's case by case for you all. And that's difficult if I'm an investor. If I'm going to build a brand new building, I don't really know what the standards are. And you guys don't understand. So you know, an example I give, it's not right downtown, but the old Shaw's Motel in the corner of Pomeroy Terrace. You require them to rebuild the sidewalks and the street trees and the drainage out front, as our standards require. But there's not enough room to do a sidewalk as wide as we'd like, and a tree belt as wide as we'd like, and drainage as wide as we'd like. So you all, in a case by case, said, well, here's the trade-off, right? You know, we can't do everything. We ha I'm making up the numbers, I don't remember, but we have 12 feet, and all the ideal stuff would add up to 16 feet. Would you rather less tree belt, or rather less sidewalks? And again, it's difficult for the regulated community. The standards could be different. Um, so we began a process downtown of more formally changing the form-based code, which would mean everything from better graphics to understand the zoning, more thinking about the design of the buildings, um, thinking about that what we call the public realm, one of the, the standards for the sidewalks, and also thinking about just as you all have discretion for site plan, central business architecture has lost the discretion, and that worries developers. Um, but it also worries about it. So about it don't know what's going to happen. And if you don't like the outcome, everybody sues. You don't get the permit you like, you sue. You do get the permit you like, the neighbors sue. Um, and so the more we can spell out these standards, the more we can make those things you know, clear. Central Business District has been growing steadily. It's almost three times the size it was 30 years ago, mostly taking over other commercial districts. In that growth, we keep expanding central business architecture but it's not always a perfect fit. Central Business Architecture was really written for the old brick masonry buildings downtown. As you go down Pleasant Street, you know, we're not trying to pretend that the lumber yard or buildings further down the lumber yard, we're not trying to pretend they're on Main Street. So we expect on Main Street, maybe it doesn't make sense there, so it's not always perfect. So we're 
we're working on that. We've done two presentations, I think, before you got board input. We don't have anything specifically tonight. We just sort of, we went a time where we're not talking to you as much. So, so that's one thing I want to come back to. I'm going to go through quickly what I'm going to go through tonight. The second thing is we're basically doing a similar project in Florence. Florence is more older zoning. Um, and this comes up particularly in Florence, or to a certain extent downtown, we know we're getting less retail. Um, and we know that when it's downtown's vibrant, there's lots of things happening of which retail and restaurants are part of, but people living there are part of. So Florence in particular almost has two town centers. Florence and Maple, retail, restaurants, very, you know, for a small village, very successful. And then Pie Bar and Cooper's Corners, and in between, not so active dead areas. And so one of the sort of things to think about is, is that area in between? Certainly retail is fine, and there's nothing wrong with retail. But if somebody wanted to build a three-floor apartment complex that would create life on the street, maybe that's OK in Florence. Um, that would sort of create different ways to get vibrancy. We did the same sort of thing downtown a few years ago. We used to require all first floors be, be commercial. And now we say only 20 feet back. As long as you hide the residential, that is. So, so Florence is the second thing. Again, a similar presentation, but it was more about what should Florence look like sort of 100 years ago than, than back now. Um, so the third one we got, we have a contract for from the same uh, consultant, is thinking about two family homes. And I don't think we haven't done anything here yet for that, have we? No, I think we just briefed them. Okay. That so they get two family, and this is a debate. You all may not, you, we haven't even asked you to opine on this yet, but um, we allow two family homes in URB and URC, which are two densest residential districts, and they're allowed there by right. And then part of cluster development, where you have a big parcel of land and carve out some building lots to keep the rest in open space, we allow two family homes there. The rest of the city, we don't. Starting 33 years ago, we allowed accessory apartments by right everywhere in the city. It's been one of the most successful ways to allow smaller apartments and condos in the city. And so we began to talk about, well, should we allow two families by right either in more districts or everywhere in the city? When we thought about where you get criticism, particularly for two family homes, it's about two things, or three things. Traffic. Um, parking, and the design of buildings. There's no question some investor-owned properties don't look that, that good. And so we said, well, maybe form-based code is a way to do this. So, so you know, one potential thing is allow, uh, allow two-family homes everywhere in the city if you meet a rigorous form standard. And if you don't want to meet that, then we stick with, you know, we, we can either require that even you are being your city, or we can say, we're continuing our current standards for URB and C, it's only for the expansion. I personally think it makes sense to do everything, but that's that's what's good for you. So we're beginning to work on that. And I want to walk you through just some of so the because that hasn't been before you. So I can't get onto the networking slides. So I don't have any slides. Do you want me to try here? It's really fine. I don't have anything for two families anyway. So we just there's some questions from our consultant when I come back to you to say what's really important for two family homes in, in the city. Well first are you at all interested in this basic premise of allowing them everywhere in the city? And if we are, what, where, does it make, where does it make sense? When, when you say everywhere in the city, are you including downtown business? Or is it everywhere but Main Street? Everywhere, uh, yeah, everywhere, or residential districts. Okay, all right. Um, or commercial districts would allow single family homes. But, so um, do, we have, do we have any of our business left? <coughs> so we have, we have maybe one district that allows them. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if you want but basically wherever a home could be. So right now, if you can do a home, you can do a home and an accessory apartments. Right. Um, as we're seeing the average size the average size of single family homes isn't necessarily dropping, but the average size of two families are. So often a two family home is exactly the same thing as a single family home and accessory apartments. Right. And yet we allow one and not not the other. So and then the last thing and I'll, the rest of the time is for you all is We've applied for a grant. We haven't heard it yet, but well, we're getting it yet. But the, the premise of the grant is to do more form-based code. And we didn't identify where. We said the places where it's the greatest opportunity for more housing. The state's very concerned about not having enough housing, both market-rate housing and affordable housing. So 
be able to define that. So one of the questions for you all is, what would the next spot be? Um, and, and you can imagine two approaches. One could be looking at other business districts where housing isn't very controversial, but the market's not so driving it. Or looking at dense residential neighborhoods where housing is incredibly controversial. On the other hand, some people it's controversial because they're worried what it looks like, and so maybe we win them over. So, what happens with like, if I have a, a a house with this uh, mother-in-law or the little thing on it, and then I decide that I want a to turn it into a duplex? Is, are they? Is anything? I mean, so now I have three forms of income coming off of that lot first. I mean, is that so? Accessory apartments, the way they are now, are only allowed in single-family homes. So would that have to? So in other words, if I had a single, if I have a single-family home and an accessory apartment, am I allowed to turn my single-family home okay. into a duplex? No. Again, in URC, where we allow multifamily. Yeah. Yes. In cluster projects, where we allow units based on the acreage. Yes. Yeah. But generally, in most residential neighborhoods. No. Okay. There you go. It also depends on the lot size. You know, that's what we allowed. We allowed accessory units everywhere in the city, regardless of the lot size, because it was attached, necessarily attached by definition to a single family home. So, and we still consider it a single family home, but we still require you to go up in lot size uh, based um, for each unit that you add to that lot. Didn't we, didn't we make a decision or I thought there was something about we changed something so that something couldn't have a, a like a bathtub or a rescue. Yeah. Wasn't yeah. there, wasn't there yeah. like yeah. something? I forget what it was, but we. For detached accessory dwelling? It wasn't for, it was for defining what an accessory structure right. is. So okay. an accessory structure doesn't have bathing or kitchen facilities. Okay. And unless it's. it's yeah, okay. that is different from a dwelling. So once you, a dwelling is, has a kitchen and a bath or bathing facility. So these ones that are, that are allowed by right are attached to the house and so they, but if I turn like my, my garage, a detached garage into an accessory, that's a different, we, that's a different. That's a detached accessory. That's allowed under two circumstances. You have to meet setback requirements for the okay. house and that requires a special permit from the zoning board. Okay. So, so if that garage is off the property boundary, no. If it's out, depending on the district, 10 feet, 20 feet, and you went to the zoning board, they might say yes. Okay. But they don't have to. So <clears throat> real quickly, the pros and cons of two family houses everywhere in residential district. And again, I think there were some uh, <clears throat> articles that were spread around us to, to kind of look at this. Um, <clears throat> people are opposed to them because often the design is a little bit different. It brings more traffic to the city. Um, beyond that, I don't know. It, it, uh, beyond that, I don't know. The benefit, certainly from this guy's perspective, is uh, younger families can go in and have a house and have a, a, a stream of income in order to help them live there. It provides more residential um, opportunities in the city. Um, so help me with some of the other reasons for... But the demographics changing dramatically. I mean, our average family size is plummeting. Yep. And both because we're all living longer and just the nature of Northampton, our median age is getting a lot older and a lot more people are singles by themselves. So, I mean, you all say, if you ask anybody how much building's going on, they say, oh, Northampton's growing wildly in population. And yet our population's been dropping for 20 years and was stable for 40 years before that. And it's mostly about there's just a lot fewer people, and a lot of them want smaller spaces. Mm -hmm. And the cost of houses obviously has gone up dramatically. Um, I don't want to oversell it. You know, we know that the cost of kitchens and bathrooms are the most expensive house, the most expensive rooms. So just dropping a bedroom doesn't have as much savings as dropping a bathroom or dropping. It. You know, you're not going to drop a kitchen properly. Uh, but you say something, it's still savings. Do our parking requirements change drastically when it's a two-family versus a, a single-family? So you all did already change that. So the standard is now is, it used to be two parking spaces per dwelling unit. Now it's one parking space per 1,000 square feet 
up to a maximum of two parking spaces per dwelling. So that creates a reward for a smaller unit. Um, and we have required a, a one additional parking space for accessory dwellings, which were under 1,000 square feet anyway. So it sort of matches that one additional parking space for the accessory. We've, we've had accessory dwellings. We're one of the first communities in the state that have accessory dwellings. We've had them for, I think, 32 or 33 years. And we experimented. We started with 800 square foot by special permit, then went 800 square feet by right, then went to 900 square feet by right, and then we did that att detached one by special permit. And we've certainly had some complaints, but it would it's probably less than almost everything else out there. Um, and so that's part of the reason thing is two families, the next state. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still, and now I, I think I'm a little confused about the type of structure we're talking about. I mean, I live off North Street, and it seems like every house there um, is now a duplex. I mean, I thought of them as duplexes, but do you consider them one, like, if a single family home? They were a single family home at one time. Are they single family homes with? Any? There's probably duplexes there. Okay. Um, so in URC, one could in theory do accessory dwelling unit, but you can do two family home by right. So there's no real benefit of doing accessory dwelling unit unless you have less than 5,000 square feet. Because you, you require 2,500 square feet of lot area per dwelling unit. Okay. If you have less than 5,000 square feet, then you'd have to do single family in, in ADU. Right. But ADUs limit you, one, you have to be, owner has to live in one unit or the other, you can only have one front door, and so you would always go to two family if you could. Got it. Okay. Um, as you go further out, with two family is just not an option. Yeah. An accessory apartment open mandates that there only be one front door? Yeah, yes. You can you can hide you can do the door from the side. You could do a single door of the lobby in front, but it's a eight. door facing the street. Well, right. It's supposed to present as like a single family, right. and then there's this extra thing that you still have to have so two means of egress to all both units, just not facing the street. So that's I mean I, I don't want to dump into the weeds. We can go wherever you want, but that's the sort of question we want to ask you. So when when we did ADUs, the idea was to fool people to make you think it's a single family home. Is that still a goal? Do we do we want to say you should only have one door? Are we okay with two doors in front? And so, if you get a kind of a vote of approval that the planning board wants to move forward to allowing these um, two-family homes in most of the areas, then you're going to build in those kind of um, visuals into the the new form-based code. Uh, correct. And I'm saying it's a long road to get it done, yeah. but yes. And, and so we wouldn't go and get it adopted by the city council prior to, to the form-based code. Correct. Right. 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 Let me say, I mean, there, there are, we could give you a tour of, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. There are certainly bad examples. Some it's in the eye of the beholder, but there's some things that pretty clearly are bad. You know, no articulation, no windows, blank walls that most people would agree with. And, and, and why not address those kinds of things? Realistically, what do you think the sort of overall time frame is? Like, how how big a an effort is that? Like, is this a multi-year effort, or is this like is so the, just from the consultants? Right, because it's partially grant funded. The contracts till June, so it's supposed to finish by June. But I don't know in terms of the political process. Yeah, you know, it's that's a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is obviously we they're going through the design piece. Mm -hmm. The part, the question for probably some districts are easier for you to reach consensus on, and some are harder. And and it may be the same thing. Maybe this passes in second URC because we're almost there already, and maybe it never passes in the RR. Maybe you guys can support RR. So just we're not trying to influence you, but staff is comfortable. The staff is comfortable. Two families by right in the entire city when the design is there, but that <coughs> doesn't mean you have to. Be. And RR wing is Ward Six and Ward Seven, basically. Yes, not not the developed part of Leeds, right. um, and not a lot of Ryan. So it's just like Kennedy Road and that's right. Yeah. My friend Alan lives. Yeah. How do you feel about two families? Yeah. 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 The more the better. There you go. So we have the political willpower. <laughs> that and it's funny where the pushback would be. So RR is the most rural, but it's also the most separation be home between homes, so there may be the least impact. Um, I suspect that Ryan Road area is the area you get some of the greatest impact. You have homes that are pretty close together. Um, 
So, uh, you know. I, I have to think, I think that having, having a right makes, makes sense, but I, I'd like to see some, if that right is, is uh, exercised, that there are very, very strict aesthetic rules for it. Because I, I think that, you know, if I buy a house that has a, it's a single family house, I, you know, and it's in this, in this you know, the, the problem with some of the, ex, and some of the extensive infill, but as I see it, is that it, it, it takes advantage of, of your, of my right to do something yeah. versus my right to have a, a house that I already purchased uh, in place. And so I, I just think that you have to have very, and I think you, you potentially could pass it yeah. if, like, you know, if you decided, you know, you had to have one door. I mean, yeah. if that, you know, it, I think it, it could honestly be very, like, you know, the person wouldn't have a whole lot of rights to do, you know, this, their aesthetic would be very controlled. Yeah, right? okay. So let me just run through a couple, some of the things so that's followed yeah. through that round. So, Traditionally, people say windows and doors are really important. You don't have blank walls. Would that fit? Yes, 100%. Okay. So the other one that we get particularly frustrated with builders is they often design from the inside out. And so the windows and doors happen to be whatever's convenient for the layout, which I get. You, know, you put your bedroom where your bedroom is, you put your bathroom where your bathroom is, and then you get windows that don't line up and don't make sense. It, and, and I. That would be a. I think that's where the problem is. Is that, okay. is that things should line up, and if you can't do, if you can't put in a building, if you can't do what you want to do, you can't, if you can't put in a second unit and things line up where, where they should, then you shouldn't do it. And I think, and that's just I think it seems like a fair. You know, okay. move, moving the window, if you can't, I mean, and part of it is that. In reality, in terms of building, if you can't afford to move that window, then you can't afford to do the project. And I think that that's that's where that, that's just the reality. Yeah. Okay. Not sure that I would agree as a generalization. No. It's hard to, if you can't, I have to see any particular design to give an opinion. All right. So one approach. I mean, certainly for this to work. We want to have a formula that's here's what you can do by right. Yeah. But one of the choices we could say is, here's the formula. If you do this, you can you could build. If you don't do it, you can't build. Or there's an in-between, which Alan, maybe you're, you're pushing at is saying, here's the formula to do by right, and you can always come before the planning board for a special permit, because you might have some unique, you know, my house is 5,000 feet back yeah. from the road, and who cares if it's? 100%. Right. OK, right. And we should always have room for something to come in. And are we talking generally about new construction or people adapting existing structures to make them? It would fit both, but it's probably more common for new construction. I don't know, Carolyn in a better sense because she tracks these of accessory dwelling units. They are often existing buildings, but they're often carved out. Right. I don't have a sense for new building. I don't think we know because we don't allow them. My guess is new construction is more common. Convert a single family home into a two family. I guess that's what I was talking yeah. about. Right. That, that, well, was, that was my image. My image. I thought we were talking about converting. Uh, you know, I buy a single family right. home and I convert it okay. into a duplex. We'd be neutral. So we'd be neutral to cover both. I guess I was answer guessing what the market will go with. And my guess is new construction, but I really could be wrong. You know, we. So in the seventies, we're camping down zone. And a lot of people with multifamily went to single family, and then we upsell in the last 20 years and allowed them to go back, and relatively few of them have come back. Right. Yeah, because I know in my neighborhood there's a lot of houses, I think, that had a history as a multifamily. Yeah. Now are single family. Yeah, so. for the most part they don't, but at least the plumbing and staircases would be there probably. Right. So you could convert a bedroom back to a kitchen, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the only reason I'm skeptic, <laughs> the, the only reason I'm guessing it's more new construction is in URC, you can do that by right, and we just don't see that many of those units coming back. Um, you know, so we certainly might, you know, and his family size keeps dropping, and there's few people buying a 3,000 or even a 2,500 square foot.
single family home, they might be referring to Coral Gables. So, okay, the, the, so just to so to start, jump ahead 20 years when the, the 10 of us are all sharing one autonomous car that drives around by itself you know, while we're sleeping we to, to pick long? people up or whatever. <laughs> and, and so you have all these garages that are now empty. Has there any been any discussion about detached uh, accessory units that existing that do not need set yeah. about converting those to a if just like a, a owner occupied accessory apartment so you need to live in the house right. to have that that type of thing the housing partnership has certainly suggested that our individuals in the housing partnership the argument against it maybe there's a couple arguments against it first unless it's a gorgeous carriage house right there's not that much value in the garage and you're redoing it you're spending so much money that we shouldn't do it if it didn't make sense and if you do a new home, you can really get all those design things we're talking about. If you're redoing a garage, you know, some of the garage, at least I used to live in Ravel Alba, South Street. Some of the garages are literally six inches from the property, from the garage, over the property. Right. Right. Um, and so maybe that's not the best ones to reuse. Um, so, so that's why we haven't gone there yeah. already for, for doing it, you know. Maybe we'll start a decommissioning fund for useless garages. But people Maybe still want to store their bicycles. Yeah, yeah. True. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, so it's yes. This is exciting. I mean, it's, there's this kind of stuff that's going on all over the country, and it's very cool that Northampton is considering it and trying it. And you know, we have a housing crisis, and we have a lot of a lot of land and a lot of space. Yeah. So let me come back to the door. So, so I heard agreement about. Windows, doors, symmetry, um, special permits as an estate. How I think you were nodding. You didn't care about it. No, so, I, you know the the kind of you know underlying principle. I, I don't think that we need to pretend or, or say that there's something inherently wrong with multifamily housing. Like, yep. It's not worse or less than or you know it's something we need to be hiding or you know. And so uh, I would say you know that yeah. That, Having not pretending that stru the structure is a single family home that just happens to house more people um, is that's from my perspective not something that we need to hold on to anymore. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you. We don't need to hide it at all, but it just needs to look. Yes. Right. That, it needs to be yeah. symmetry. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I think, yeah, it, I think it, 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 I mean, that's really cause first of all, if you're trying to pass it, you know, if, you're, if the goal is to be able to pass this. Uh, you know, politically, there have you have to be able to say, "This is your property. If you vote before, it's still gonna match." Okay, mm -hmm. good. Okay, right. so along with that, again, we can go back to wherever, wherever you want this. But along with that, when we think about that pushback, it's partially about the design of the buildings, it's partially about the parking. We are assuming, but tell us if you disagree, that that means we still want one driveway. So, and that's not not so much about pretending it's not there, but it's about Curb cuts are dangerous. Yeah, yeah. That's where you get crashes. Yeah. Um, and it does matter if you were involved with this one on, on uh, Ryan Road. If someone did an accessory apartment, and then they said, oh, this is horrible. I have to walk across the front yard, and my dad's in a wheelchair. We, we need to let him do a second drive. Yeah, 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 yeah we, we actually yeah. said that they have to turn it back to sell it. OK. Yeah. yeah. But, to, but in terms of going forward, you're okay saying one driveway still. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think not mandating extra as well. Right. I actually, not all of us agreed with that decision. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I actually, I mean, this is personal experience with one of, one of my units is that I, I felt that if I could have expanded, made the driveway a little wider, it actually would have been safer. And this is, I mean, this is just my anecdotal yep. information, but. I think that one of the things that, that would make sense, and if you're looking at turning something from a single to it, it is allowing, it's really thinking about, you know, maybe not, certainly not adding a curb cut, but widening the curb cut yeah. to make it so that two cars can can drive onto the space side by side versus. Uh, Although that's well, probably less safe for cyclists and pedestrians. Well, I, well I actually, I mean, again, in my in this situation, yeah. it was the fact that doing this weird turn, it was sort of this blind section when I first, if I just looked up the back and back 
backed up, it would have been safer than this. But you wouldn't want that if you had to sacrifice, say, the front yard, so that you make the driveway wider, but now you're parked in front of it. Yes. Like, no. you know. So yeah. if the room allows. If the room allows. Yeah. 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 Well, the other thing is you can have still a 15-foot curb cut yeah. and then widen it on the property so that two cars can go right. side by side. Yeah. I think right. I'd be concerned feet. with allowing two cars Wide to come and go, curbs. you know, yeah. at any moment. You're creating some traffic there. Well, I mean, in this situation, it, I think it's the situation, it was, it was on sort of a yeah. hill, but I actually felt that it was would have been better to have a, it would have been safer and better it, versus this bottleneck. <coughs> so what else? What? Do you love about your neighbor's houses and hate about your neighbor's houses? So that's how you who owns them. Like, do you think about features of the design versus features of bad design? I mean, the issues that have, when we've had a lot of neighbors show up about developments, has like the massing, the people having issues, the setback, you know, conformity with the neighborhood. It's always been a big thing. I don't think, to Sam's point, if somebody presented something that, in general, um, you know, uh, it, it read well from the street level in relation to the other houses around it, then there's, usually there's not a lot of pushback. It's when it doesn't, then immediately people raise their hand. Although on like a Ryan Road, you know, where there's like quite small ranch houses, like wouldn't it be hard yeah. to do, I yeah, mean, yeah, you yeah, know, there's right. a point at which if our zoning allows, you know, 25 feet in height or something and the families, yeah, that right. there's just the, arithmetic of like we're gonna have to be okay with things looking a little different at some point. Mm -hmm. So Mark, when you say conformity, what do you mean exactly? Well I'm just thinking of you know in the past when people when a development has has stirred up emotions it's because normally it's, it's the development is bigger than the housing to the left or right of it or down the street. It's 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 larger than or the setback is greater than most of the other houses on the street, and so um, it, it 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 reads differently from the street that this you know, one of these things is not like the other, and so. Um, but to Tessa's point, so that's when you're doing something where you have some larger houses and this one's even bigger, just because you can make it bigger. Right. Versus if you have a if you're out where there's a bunch of smaller ranch houses and you can do something big, then it's it's really going to stick out, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. Right. Um, um, so it is 8 p.m., so we will open up our 8 p.m. hearings. I don't want to cut off our discussion, but I would have to cut off our discussion. <laughs> um, so, yes, I don't want to, but I have to. So, um, so I'm sure when you'll come Wait, back Matt, and so update us. And do we have a again. homework assignment with this, or anything to think about? Or? Yeah, so maybe the whole, I mean, you don't want to look at the design centers before you decide anything. But maybe one of the things is, are you comfortable with the, I mean, our current premise is we're looking at all of residential districts in the city, right. but look at a map or drive around mm -hmm. and think if anyone has any concern. I mean, mm -hmm. so far I'm hearing it's okay, but I'm not holding you to it. So no. My other question or maybe comment is just, you know, the more that you all, I mean, I'm going to be not taking part in this for a lot longer, but, you know, I mean, thinking of it as form as opposed to design, like, you know, we have seen projects mm -hmm. come where some of us like modern design and don't want to build a house that's a Victorian, you know, and that's that's very different from form. And so to the extent that we don't get into like everything has to be have like white trim or something like that's right. You know, like the word here is just it's, and I ask him to clarify what right. form means right. because I personally I haven't had a problem with these two major projects that have in the neighborhood, you know, town that how far can we go in terms of conformity right. and, you know, yeah, I'm not so that's, for, I have a problem with Truman mm -hmm. Show type of thing. I'm, I'm right. modern right, versus, right. Yeah. Well, it's not yeah. the architecture, it's more of a, so when you say standards, right, right, right. So right. We right. Yeah. Yeah. standards, yeah. standards, yeah. standards, yeah. standards. Right. Right. standards. Right. but there are some things, I mean, what, whether a gable roof counts against your height or not is a way to influence form, you know, right. form and search it. Right. I so, think what would really help me is having some of those visuals we talked about, even if they're photos from existing houses. Or I don't want to shame anybody. I mean, good a good example and a bad example, but there have been some that have built that kind of people have, and yes. so that would be really helpful. Yeah, um, we definitely get that. I want to give this feedback to the consultant yeah. first before they yeah. got there. Can I say one thing? I, one of the things that I think would be interesting, and I don't know if this would be done, but 
And I'm not saying you will, you will allow a neighbor to say what you can and can't do. But I think that there is a value in, in making it so that the neighbor at least has been informed that this is, that this is happening. Um, so that any sort of concerns, you know, it's, you know, some people, again, some people take their rights as though they should, they can just do what they want. Yeah. And I always, and I always find that rudeness, unfortunately, is a right, and it shouldn't be allowed. Okay. Of course. And on that note, we'll have to. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of. Uh, you have to. I'm saying the person should be informed. Yeah. I'm not saying that they should be able to dictate, but they should be informed. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. This is, yeah, it's really it's exciting. Uh, We'll start with our EPM hearing, which is a continuation. Uh, it was previously unopened of a hearing on a site plan amendment for a 1924 LLC, the former Clark School, to remove steps at Accessory Pickleball Court at 40-54 Round Hill Road, Northampton, FID 31B-4. We'll start with a presentation from the applicant before we take public comments. The applicant here with a presentation. Thank you. You can just close that. <laughs> Exit app. Just hit cancel. Yeah, or the orange X in the upper corner. Can I use the mouse? Yes. Usually, pretty good at this. <laughs> servicing 
these these four residential units. Um, their parking is on the opposite side of this uh, this lot area. So this is a private patio, and we thought that not only are we creating a potential nightmare for ourselves as far as liability and their <coughs> maintenance of those stairs, but we're also um, cutting off the privacy of their uh, their patio area. And we do have we do have not I don't want to say a lot of pedestrian traffic running through the campus, but there's there's quite a few dog walkers and just general folks that like to use the property for walking. Um, we don't mind that, but there are some private areas that we're trying to create for the residents, and this is one of them, and we just didn't want this to be kind of a cut through for anybody that goes through the property. So we thought that it would be better to eliminate these stairs, and if they did want to, I mean, obviously they can certainly access their vehicles without any problem, but if they did want to access the upper end of the property, they certainly could walk along this driveway, which, um, is very low traffic. It uh, it has you know it has a uh, it has a, a you know pretty pretty um, conspicuous turn turn here, so traffic will be running relatively slow down the driveway. And it, the driveway is really only for the private use of those residents of the building. So we don't see a lot of vehicular traffic on here. We don't think it'll be a danger if the, if the residents of the, uh, the boiler house want to walk up to the upper end of the property. Um, the steps originally that were designed here didn't go to a sidewalk. They actually came up to a road that was up here. So this is just another access to the road is walking up their private driveway. So this is how it was originally presented to the planning board. I'll pull up the new proposal. And this is an engineered wall from the, uh, from the manufacturer. So this is the new wall that, that was designed and we're proposing. Place. Landscaping won't change much. We changed the configuration of the patio a little bit. Um, we have a we have a very substantial um, subsurface um, stormwater drainage system that we put down in this area as well to catch water from the parking area. But the wall now runs from the same um, corner of the uh, boiler building around on, pretty much on the same configuration and now runs to the back of the engineer's cottage which also be, will be a single family residence and allows us now also to create a, a more private patio for the engineer's cottage off that side door. So we think that it um, that enhances the area and the privacy for both the residents of the boiler house and for the engineer's cottage. Um, so that's our proposal. Technical questions from the board? There's no sidewalk. There's no sidewalk. They, the, the stairs just, they, didn't, they just went to another road. They just went to the road that's up here, correct? Yeah. Basically a parking lot, but it, you know, an access driveway around the campus. Okay. So I, I just want to um, clarify, I think it, um, so you're breaking the um, presentation into two pieces, this one piece and then the pickleball court piece. Correct. Did, that, did, the, did the presentation of the pickleball court change? Do you want to proceed with that, or I thought um, we were continuing that? Yeah, so I think the, probably, so the question is, um, so the applicant still has not um, finalized the stormwater report amendment, so there's a stormwater management plan for the entire campus mm -hmm. on this side. Um, an amendment was required for the portion of this amendment request related to the pickleball court because it was a um, new area that hadn't been accounted for in the drainage. Uh, the DPW hasn't um, reviewed that amendment yet, so technically you can't close the hearing on this, but you can certainly hear about all the issues and then wait for that stormwater permit to be issued, and then when that's done, maybe in two weeks, have you know a final vote on, on the whole site plan. So um, uh, what Mr. Huber is asking is whether it makes sense to go through the uh, um, review of the pickleball court or just focus on this and sort of parse out the discussion that way. Um, I think it might make sense just to hear about the pickleball court as well and get all those issues right. out. And if it's just stormwater, then when it comes back, yep. you just say, okay, we can close the hearing and be done. And we have a half an hour to spend now, right? Yeah. 
Well, we have an 845. Well, that's yeah. never stopped us in the past. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah, I think I just assume you're here. Here, everything. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, are there any questions on the re retaining wall at all? George. So, um, the engineer's house, where do those folks park? They have the option of parking on the lower lot, but they have a walkout basement. It's, in, it's a finished basement, but so they can walk into the basement from the lower lot, or they can park. There's parking up uh, on the upper side of their their residence as well, so they can park. There's we have parking for almost 160 right. cars in the main part of the main parking area. Right. All right, all right. So we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that uh, vehicular traffic is separated from pedestrian traffic, but we're assuming here that people will be walking in the driveway. I hear that you think cars will be going slow there, but because it is a blind turn and all, are we going to stripe that driveway for like a uh, um, for walkers, or do you think that's not necessary? Because um, if it is the only way to get up there, I, and I and I hear what you're saying about other people using the campus, um, and, and we don't want to see you put a chain link fence around the campus at all. Folks come up off that old road that comes right up there to the back of the building, right? We took that out. You took that out. But it's still it's still open still, foot track. It's still a path. Yeah, so I think you're still going to have public coming up there and then walking up the driveway. So I would suggest somehow that we strike that to give people an idea that, okay, I'm going to stay to the left of the road. I'm not going to walk down the center of this driveway, up and down the center of this driveway. I, I will tell you that, um, that because we flattened out this surface considerably where the driveway comes in the parking lot, mm -hmm. Anyone that's walking up from below is going to have a difficult time navigating that hill. It's it's not an easy walkway. So I don't think that we're going to have a lot of Maybe we have some kids, but I think general walkers aren't going to come up from below. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm open to striking it. This, um, even though there is there is a turn here, um, it's not, there's no, there's no piping on the, on this left side along between the driveway and the house. It's not really a blind turn. It's extremely visible. And I'm anticipating that, again, I consider it a private driveway really just for the residents. Uh -huh. So I think those folks are going to be very well aware of the potential for any walkers. And I, I don't know. I, okay. right. Is there, uh, from the, the old steam house, boiler house, is there a back egress towards, is there any kind of exit off the back side of this? All the access is to the front of the building and to the parking lot space. Correct. So people aren't going to scramble up that hillside and go down. Not at all. That's that's about a 12 foot drop there. Yeah. 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 So that was just my concern: is that we're mixing up, you know, the yeah. driveway traffic and pedestrians. Yeah, just in general, I I don't know about the idea of uh, requiring the owner of land to provide for people using the property in the neighborhood. Yeah, that would be a slippery no, slope. No, yeah. we're, not, yeah. we're not doing that. It's just well, but even, I thought you were suggesting perhaps striping the driveway or providing safety, having safety provisions for neighbors. Uh, no, no, I'm really, residents. it's for the residents. They're going to get some ancillary kind of traffic through there, but it's really just for the residents. And, and I don't know how many units are going to be in that building? Four single bedrooms. Or single bedrooms, so but you have any parking spaces. Potentially, potentially there, there may be, I, I can't imagine that there's going to be more than eight people in the building. I'm hoping there's only four, but um, but we've made a combination for eight. And, and I assume we'd already been through this during yeah. another hearing, so I, I'm, a, I'm sorry to open it up again because I wasn't here for that. Yeah. Is there a handicapped space there also? Is that required? That was not required for this building. So I think when they, when they, um, when we had the handicap allocation, I think it was based on the, uh, the entire yes. parking lot. Yes, so we've, we've got plenty of yeah, the area a lot. Any technical questions? Um, can we hear about pickleball? And then sure. we'll open it up to public comment. Love pickleball. For sport rules. Yes, you would. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Go 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 <laughs> So, you know, in hindsight, I would just like to mention that, um, yeah, you know, I started playing pickleball a couple of years ago and I, I it's. Tremendous fun. Um, it does happen to, to be sometimes it's a little bit noisy. Uh, doesn't look, noise doesn't bother me at all. I, I, I like the activity. We, we had a um, 
we had a um, we had a tennis court, I think two tennis courts on the campus at one point, and we removed those to make way for a parking lot. So that type of activity was on the campus at one point. The area, and let me pull up that slide, um, but I guess what I was going to say in hindsight, I probably would have came with an application for an athletic surface, an outdoor athletic surface, because we, pickleball's fun. If someone wants to play tennis on this surface, it'll accommodate tennis as well. If someone wants to put a portable basketball hoop out there, we can do that, they can play basketball. We're going to bring, we're actually gonna start moving employees into the building within the next two weeks, because the gate with hall um, renovation is just about complete. We're gonna move 75 employees up there in the next couple of weeks. Um, we've made accommodations there for about 135 employees, so at some point, we expect to have well over 100 employees working in that building. We do have an 1,800 square foot inside athletic facility. We'd like to have an area where the employees can go outside and have an area that, uh, so pickleball, tennis, basketball, badminton, whatever it might be. Um, I like pickleball. I originally envisioned it as pickleball. I know it creates a little bit of, a, of, a, um, of an issue. Some people think that it's extremely noisy. Yeah, it is. You know, it's out there. So according, anyway. according, to, so according to Wikipedia, that is a mixture of how it's sport. So the racket sport combines tennis, badminton, and people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's played like it combines tennis, badminton, and table tennis. It's mini tennis. Thank you. And it's, it's the surface that we're proposing is 60 by 60. It will allow us to put, which is essentially about the size of a tennis court. You can. If we play at Hampshire College a lot. Hampshire College has has um, created two pickleball courts within one tennis court, so it's about the same size. Uh, but let me show you where we were proposing to do this. <coughs> so no more no more questions on the retaining wall. So can I just clarify? So. No more questions on the chain wall, but we are going to continue this overall presentation until the next, which includes the chain wall and the pit wall or athletic service. Right. You right. can make a determination. Um, you know, the the issue for the stormwater amendment really only relates to the pickleball piece. It doesn't relate to the retaining wall. There's no stormwater right. change. But it's one application. It's one application right. Right. for amendment. Right. So you can't technically close. Right. The cool. hearing. Can, okay. we get, can we give them the okay about the retaining wall? Yes, I think you could. Yeah. Um, really? Under one application, do you take that vote to approve the. Um, Your whole permit um, vote, I mean, you could split the vote in terms of saying you can move ahead with this, but the formal permit wouldn't be issued until you close the hearing. So there would be. I mean, essentially, be kind of like property owner that we aren't going to. Right. But they couldn't start building. They, they could do the right. retaining wall because okay. it's not necessary to the stormwater. Permit okay. If you all felt that it was appropriate, and and if the only thing you're holding out for is the stormwater permit, right. then it's sort of like an administrative approval for one piece of it. Is it really that big of a change? Because it doesn't affect stormwater. It doesn't affect parking. You know, you can have that conversation. Sorry, Carolyn, you didn't copy that off of the drive. It's on the right hand side, I think, lower right maybe, or. Um, is it the one in the center there? Yeah, boiler you have boiler house, you have check writer site plans, but there was another a set, one that S, you, There was another one for historic. I didn't pull the historic one over, um, so it's on your thumb drive still. Okay. But did you plug the thumb drive back in? I do. Does it pop up somewhere here? Um, just go to. Um, oh, yeah. D drives. Yeah. D or whatever.
Okay, so I'm sorry. So we did this presentation before the Historic Commission a few weeks ago, and they, they did approve the design and the appropriateness of the pickleball court. Um, did so you receive, do you receive a permit for that? Or they just, just a certificate of appropriateness. Okay. So this is Gaywood Hall. This is the one that's recently renovated. Um, that is, uh, that's the one that will be occupied. The main entrance to Gaywood Hall in the parking area is over here. And the main entrance comes right through here. This is area over here is um, the west end of the, the building. This is where a lot of our utilities are. We have a large generator over here. We have most of our HVAC equipment over here. It's um, this 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 area actually had a asphalt surface. I know that was a little bit in question about how large it was, but there was probably about the half the half the size of a of a basketball court. So that had an asphalt surface that we actually pulled out during construction because we were just getting all these utilities in here. So we're not adding a lot of additional um, non-permeable surface uh, other than, than, than maybe another um, maybe another 30 by 30. But this is a this square is 60 by 60. It will accommodate two full pickleball courts or a full tennis court as well. Um, this is a very level surface over here. The, um, we have a residential unit that's about 50 feet away right here that will have, this is called Adam's House. Uh, we understand that this is actually the home that Calvin Coolidge lived in while he was a um, young lawyer in Northampton. But we've just recently renovated that. That's almost done as well. That's four residential units, um, or three, I'm sorry, three residential units. units. And again, this is our office building. So the office building is right up against the pickleball court. So the, um, this is a relatively flat surface. We will have to, um, to level it off, we'll have to put maybe a, looks like maybe a one or two foot retaining wall against, uh, on these two sides here. We were, re it was requested by the Historic Commission that we put as much um, planting material in here to cover the fence that will be required. The fencing on it is, um, we originally pr proposed six and a half foot fence, I believe. Um, it doesn't really require. Was the original? Yeah, I think I think that's a six and a half foot. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, that's, that's what we proposed to the uh, to the historic commission. Commission. The ball doesn't fly outside of the area like a tennis ball does, or a golf ball, or anything like that, or even a basketball. It's it's. Pickleball is, is played with a with a hardened wiffle ball, so it doesn't go very far. You know, I mean, you can hit it as hard hard as you could, and it, you couldn't hit it the length of this room. So it's uh, it's made for older folks like myself that don't want to chase the ball very far. So it's um, so we don't have to have that high of a fence, but we thought that if there we were going to try to do any noise abatement. The, the nearest abutter is about 100 and, I think about 175 feet in this direction over here. Um, they do go across, they're on the other side of the driveway and then some additional plantings and then their driveway as well. Um, I think the noise potential for this, um, for this activity, if it's going to affect anyone in the area, would certainly affect the residential units that we are developing here, as well as folks that are in our office. Um, I'm not here to debate, you know, the, the noise level or whether that's aggravating to someone or, or not. Um, but the uh, but we are prepared to put a larger fence and put additional plantings and maybe put some noise abatement material on the fence if uh, if that did become an issue. We. Um, it's an activity that we would uh, like to offer to our employees. We think that even if we have outdoor events, instead of putting a, a, an event tent on the, on the grass that's there, we could put it on this surface. So it just, it, this would accommodate a lot of outdoor activities for the company in general. So, um, so that's that. We would have a gate at one end, uh, at each end, the, uh, the west and the east side of the court. And it also gives us, I think, a unique opportunity to try to shield the area of all these utilities. This, um, 
this, gen this, this generator uh, generates power for the entire building. So it stands about nine feet tall, I think. But it gives us an opportunity to really kind of clean up this entire area here. There is one maple tree that it's a it's a red maple that I don't know the exact species, but um, I think it was Martha Lyon on the Historic Commission told me that it was an invasive species, and she thought it was actually appropriate to have it removed. <laughs> but that's again, that's just her opinion. So that what that one tree does have to be removed. Can you but point that out on the plan? it's right here, this round, right okay. there. Um, so we plan on having where, extensive. Where, sorry, we didn't see that. Where's that? Uh, that? That tree is right here. It's about. I think can't it's quite see your mouse. Right? Oh, I'm sorry. Right about there is the tree. Oh, okay. So. Yeah. So it doesn't appear on this no, right. plan already. Uh, it says right, it's defined as a two-inch maple. Oh, I don't know what you're looking at. And this yeah. one right here is defined as a two-inch maple. I think it's actually about a seven-inch maple. So. But we do plan on having extensive plantings between the pickleball court and the and Adams House residential unit and and extensive plantings between the uh, on the on the south and the east side of the course as well. And how long would it take to install the pickleball court? Probably only about two weeks. It's just grading, it's surface grading, and we would put an uh, probably a two or three inch uh, asphalt surface down. <clears throat> I'm not sure we would do it this year, but we want to get Put this through if we can. Um, we did have we did have test pits already dug for uh, to uh, and we had an engineer present to um, to check the soil samples because we're planning on uh, the runoff is not going to be into stormwater. It's just going to be off of the court to the west side uh, and uh, to the I'm sorry to the to the east and south. So uh, again, it's not a significantly large surface in relation to <coughs> all the asphalt that's already. On the, on the site the parking. The plantings that you mentioned, the extensive plantings, are they called out somewhere? Are they specified? Do we? Uh, let's see. This is, is the in the historic commission. In the historic the yeah, the historic commission application. I think they did define. This small one has a plant list in the upper left. Uh, there's oh, and a quantity. I think that's yeah. the original application. It might be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We don't want to just pass oh, that sure. around. I, I, yeah. It should have been on there. Um, <coughs> is there going to be any uh, lighting at the courts? We're not planning any night activity at all on the court. Um, it will not be for public use. It will only be for residents of the, um, the property and employees. So are you locking the gates? Is that how you'll manage that? We are going to lock the gates. Um, we, you know, I mean, there's always kids in the neighborhood and they do whatever they sometimes they want to do. Um, but we're 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 not planning to offer activities right now. I'm just saying, if noise were to be an issue, it would be more of an issue at night. Um, right. So if there's no lighting, that was one of the questions as well. So. so maybe we should condition it that there would be no lighting, or there'll be no regular activity, whatever, after nine o'clock. No, I temporary lighting when you have an event there is certainly understandable, but no. No permanent lighting. No permanent lighting. Yeah, we wouldn't. I, there's no place to use it at night. Um, and quite frankly, you know, I hope it gets used. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to use it. It's not <laughs> Nobody wants to play with trash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We invited to go play with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I believe the plantings are called out. I think there were some suggestions made, but no conditions made by the by the historic commission. Um, you know, I mean, we want to make it very presentable. I mean, we're doing we're doing a lot with this property, and we're really proud of the way that it's coming out. And um, we are, uh, we're, you know, we're, the intention is not to disturb any butters or bring large crowds in, or unruly crowds or anything like that. So, so, uh, so 
currently there's a, a sidewalk, a path that goes right through the court. Um, I don't know if you're going to eliminate that because these are going to become residences over here at Adams and the other building up top. Correct. That sidewalk um, is there today. It's not, again, that's another sidewalk that's not, it serviced, it serviced an easier access to the, um, to the road. Um, but folks can clearly, again, walk down this road. This, this, this driveway over here that I'm, that I'm pointing to currently is being used. One of the conditions of the planning board approval from a couple of years ago is that that not be a primary entrance any longer it's really a service entrance and for exit only so we won't be allowing any traffic that will the only traffic we'll be allowing here is um, is uh, for either deliveries that are exiting the property that will not be an entrance so it'll be very limited traffic so I guess to answer your question if there's any if folks are walking on the property they can use that driveway to walk very easily so are you going to remove that sidewalk, more or less, the one that comes that bisects the pickleball court? Are you going to? Correct. It'll just it'll it'll just it'll drop off into the pickleball court. It'll be access from for for these residents down here. If they want to use the pickleball court, they'd be go through here. For our employees, they'd actually come out of the building and go I into see. the back side. I see. Yeah. So it's not going to be just for your employees. It's still going to be kind of for the campus. Correct. Uh, which I didn't quite understand. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Residents and, and employees of campus. Correct. Thank you. I think then we'll open it up for public comment. So um, our hearing is still open, so you can take a seat. We may have some additional questions for you after we hear from the board. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, if anyone is here and would like to make a comment on this project, please come up to the podium and tell us your name and address. May I close this? What happens if we close this? Sure, you can close it. Janet Gross, 38 Round Hill Road. We abut the southern side of this property. <clears throat> Not long after we moved to Northampton, word of the Clark School sale began spreading. Neighbors mobilized. At an early meeting, Paul Spector cautioned about infill. Wayne Fyden, I'm sorry it's not here, proclaimed his love of historic districts, urged us to submit a proposal, and added that historic district status would offer protection. We heeded his words. The proposal passed, as it should have. The pre-Clark history of Round Hill Road is quite notable. Plus, there are many well-designed and maintained Victorian residences within the district. But despite our success, protection has rarely been extended to residential neighbors. In fact, it is the developers who have been aided and abetted by the city, often with disregard for historic district standards or for the development's historic preservation restriction with the city. And it's been that way since the current owner presented his 2016 site plan and a sharp-eyed neighbor pointed out two signs identifying the development, not one, as permitted by the historic uh, district. At that time, there was also a city ordinance requiring a buffer between an office park and a residential neighborhood. We requested such a buffer since our property abuts the uh, south side of the development. But we're told there's no need to buffer the well-kept grounds of the Clark School. Since then, Check Riders South Side, as you've just been told, has become their backyard, cluttered with multiple air exchange units, containers, and an enormous generator that heaves for 20 minutes, usually Tuesday mornings. And there is the still unresolved issue of lighting, in December, electricians began drilling holes in check writers' brick facade, though the site plan showed no lights. Several meetings of the Historical Commission ensued, finally a quorum emerged, and I had the temerity to read the standard disallowing lights streaming down facades or onto landscapes. The proposal failed. For the next two nights, every single interior and exterior light at check writers raged creating an infernal and ghoulish spectacle. 
and that hut was from dawn, dusk to dawn. To our surprise, the city came to our rescue and lights were extinguished. In addition, we have endured the noise and vibrations of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, that is no exaggeration, of heavy dump trucks, as well as dozens and dozens of trailers carrying heavy equipment up and down the hill. Not to mention the noise emanating from workers' power tools, groundsmen's noisy mowers, excessively loud gas-driven blowers, and the infinite beeping of backing equipment. And just when we thought work on the development would finally cease, after more than five long years, fraught, five long fraught years, we are now threatened with pickleball courts for employees and tenants of the development, whose numbers will probably eventually approximate about 200. Since the developers can apparently modify their original site plan, the pickleball courts were very narrowly reviewed by the Historical Commission last month, and today we'll receive a similar treatment from the Planning Board. Currently, there are no athletic facilities visible or audible from a public way in the Elm Street Historic District. And there is no good reason to cre create a precedent at the expense of neighbors' quality of life. Pickleball a game played with hard graphic paddles and polymer balls has been described as ping pong on steroids. It is noisy, repetitive, resistant to abatement, disturbing at the very least, potentially damaging to human health, and hardly appropriate for Round Hill Road. On behalf of the historic district of Punta Gorda, Florida, William Thornton of Thornton Acoustics and Vibrations wrote the following. This is in 2019. The pickleball noise creates a human health risk as the link between certain types of noise, which includes the type of noise emitted by pickleball, and the risk of hypertension, heart disease, etc., is well established. The pickleball noise exceeds the limits set forth in many objective science-based community noise ordinances. And I wouldn't be surprised if it exceeds um, Northampton's noise limit. It might not exceed the Massachusetts limit, but um, there is a noise limit for the city of 70 decibels. Um, pickleball noise significantly increases the community noise levels relative to existing ambient noise levels. And the relationship between community noise increases and human en impact, annoyance, is well established in the scientific body of knowledge. Finally, there are no effective means other than enclosing the entire pickleball court in a well-designed building of reducing the noise emitted by the pickleball courts, such as noise walls, they you know walls, not fences barriers or screens. Although these types of solutions are frequently suggested, they are not effective for reasons of fundamental physics and will not reduce the noise to acceptable levels. The proposal likewise fails to meet 2018 recommendations of Spindarian Willis Acoustics and Noise Control. The proposed fence is too low, 6.5 feet, not 8 feet. And please note their recommendations call for a wall, not a mere fence. The noise barrier is of questionable value. And the court's location, largely within perpendicular brick walls, will, will serve to reflect the sharp pop of pickleball on paddle. And I note that our house is sited within the play-to-play -play orientation. This will only add to our discomfort. The court's which are located approximately 150 feet from our house and likewise from residents and offices at the de development um, are at risk. This short distance, according to Splendorian and Willis, demands more careful and expensive abatement. Why not abate the employee's gym and locate the courts inside? Finally, Splendarian and 
Willis recommends that pickleball courts to be located within 500 to 600 feet of residential properties be reviewed by an acoustical engineer during the site selection phase in order to avoid a site that is expensive to mitigate or leads to ongoing disputes or suits with neighbors. There is nary a word about an acoustical engineer in the Levesque proposal. I've also contacted Cross Spectrum Acoustics, the firm that worked on behalf of the Lumberyard Apartments. They were extremely sympathetic, confirmed my findings, and stated more than once, the research is out there. According to the city, check writers' employees are entitled to enjoyment of the owner's property. What about tax-paying property owners? Have we no right to enjoy our property, including our home's interior, free from noise pollution? I urge the planning board to look into the degradation of Round Hill Road, including the number of residents who have left and to research the negative impacts of pickleball on neighbors. In fact, failure to take pickleball's damaging noise into consideration is, I believe, unconscionable. It is likewise long overdue for the city to ensure that regulations for mixed zoning don't disadvantage <coughs> residents. And please, don't forget the impact of the 2016 conflagration. The Round Hill development has been in many ways, profoundly destructive. Pickleball courts will only add to the damage. And finally, dare I ask you how you would like pickleball courts approximately 150 feet from your home? Thank you. Thank you. Other comments from the public? My name is Tom Douglas. Um, I live at 204 Crescent Street, and uh, as you know, Crescent Street wraps around Brown Hill. Um, I've lived on Crescent Street for 29 years. I had lived at 76 Crescent Street for about 10 years, and then I moved to 204 Crescent Street um, later, um, the year after. And so I've lived on both sides of Crescent Street. At 76 Crescent Street, I could look out my backyard and see the back of the President's House of Clark School and I could hear the noise coming from there, the jazz bands that they had at the end of the year, people having fun and talking. Now I live on the other side of Crescent Street, and I can look out my back door and see the chimney of the boiler house and the back of Skinner Hall. And I lived there while Clark School was still a vibrant place, while it still had day students and boarding students. So for 30 years, I've lived at the Clark School. I've walked through that neighborhood. I have lots of friends that live in that neighborhood, lots of great neighbors. And as you know, that neighborhood is a very tight-knit neighborhood with, with um, not-so-big houses, for the most part, on small lots. And there's lots of families that live there. There's people of all different age groups that live there. There are a lot of kids that live there now. And my neighborhood is full of kids. One neighbor on one side has a pool where the kids are out there in their pool from morning to night playing in the pools, yelling, screaming, having a great time. On the other side, neighbors who have a soccer field in their backyard the kids are yelling and screaming, and it's just the signs of life. It's the sounds of life, and it's what makes that neighborhood really great. Another neighbor, had, neighbor has a basketball court. These are all the things that make this neighborhood appealing to me and make my neighbors happy for hearing these sounds, sounds of life. And they've been going on ever since I've lived on Crescent Street. I was never bothered by the um, sounds coming from the Clark School um, when the kids were there. And it's been said that the, the kids at the Clark School didn't make any noise, and it's absolutely false because they were taught oralism and they were taught to speak. And one of my best friends, who was an architect, who I spent a lot of time with, spoke to me relatively easily, made lots of sounds, made lots of noise, and um, we've heard from people who worked, with, worked at the Clark School and knew that the children there were loud because they couldn't hear themselves speak very well. and it. it if you've ever known anybody from the Clark School that went there, you know that they, they were taught to speak. They were not mute, and they were not doing sign language. So there's been a lot of noise coming from our neighborhood, 
There's a lot of noise coming from the Clark School for many years. The Clark School had two tennis courts. It had a playground on either side of Gaywith Hall. One playground had a basketball court and a big swing set. Um, the other playground was a um, preschool playground. It had a big outdoor play area where people could um, play ball. It had had the tennis courts. Um, I played up there many times. Nobody ever came out and complained to me. I played soccer up there with kids. We sled up there with kids. Nobody comes out and complains because of the noise. And I think that the pickleball court um, is going to be less noise than what was generated historically from the Clark School because there are so many kids up there and these were adults. And I don't think the adults are going to be up there screaming louder than kids do. Um, and I think it's just going to be a daytime activity. It's not going to be a nighttime activity. And the basic thing that I'm trying to say is I think that it is really a clear continuation of what's already been happening at the Clark School for over 100 years. It's outdoor activity, people having fun, and making the regular sounds of lively activity that most people really love to hear. So I, that's, I think it's a clear continuation of what's already been happening at the Clark School and should continue to happen. I don't think that um, an athletic facility in that neighborhood is out of keeping because it's been there for so many years. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, we're going to hear from anybody else who would like to speak first, and I, I do want to remind you that the purpose of public comment is for us, the board. So if you would like to talk with other folks here, you're welcome to do that outside of our hearing. Anybody else who is a member of the public who would like to make a comment? We'll take an additional comment from you. Thank you. I would like to take exception to some of Mr. Douglas's hey, comments. Think. I'm going to just pause you again. So if there is something you want to raise to the board for us to yes. evaluate, that, you know, we'll ask that you do that. But again, this isn't a conversation. Well, I understand story. that. But I, do, I have done research on the Clark School for a number of years. And um, in 1992, there was an article in the New York Times uh, by then Mr. Douglas had lived in Crescent Street for about 10 years. In that article, they talked about how few students were left at the Clark School, that it was, uh, that oralism had been, um, was now in disrepute, that when you think about it, if someone is profoundly deaf, it is virtually impossible to teach them to speak or to read lips. Um, a little girl who went to Clark during the 60s when there was the terrible rubella boom um, said she went there from age five, they kicked her out at age 12 because she knew too many real signs. She also made the point that while she was at Clark, they never read children's books because they were far too busy looking at the teacher and trying to imitate how they were speaking. It is a very flawed and fraudulent methodology. Um, so yes, students could speak to one another, but they didn't. And it, they you used some tie this into the, the what we're looking at now. Well. Clearly, that property was not full of noise of loud children. The best way for the deaf to communicate is via sign. And when the teachers weren't looking, that is what they did. Because oralism was so limited, that is why there was all the abuse at the Clark School. Thank you. Thank you. Now the board will have some deliberation. We'll kind of talk through the technical aspects of the proposed amendment um, based on the things that we have heard from the public and what we have heard from the applicant. Um, we have asked some technical questions already, but we'll have some deliberation amongst ourselves. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was surprised to hear the description of pickleball as an extremely noisy and even dangerous activity for somebody who can hear it. 
Um, twice this summer, I happened to have played tennis in a court immediately adjacent, like 20 feet away, 10 feet away. Yeah, probably 10 feet away from four people playing pickleball. It just happened both times they were playing doubles. And I honestly don't remember any noise at all. I mean, certainly nothing that struck me as distressing or disturbing or loud. I mean, I, I would, as I was hearing this description, um, I was trying to recall what it sounded like. And mostly my recollection is of the people talking while they were playing. So I, I'm puzzled by the description. It just absolutely was not my experience of playing right next door. And I would think that somebody who was 150 feet away would not be able to hear it at all. I have the notion that a company is creating an outdoor space for their for their employees to play a sport is a wonderful thing, and and more companies should do it. And I don't, I, and honestly, it's I, I find it like actually insulting the notion that somehow this is a bad thing. This is a great thing. You should be applauded. For, for creating a af an, an athletic place for your employees during the day for, for them to play sports. And I, I guess that's, that's it. I, I think anything else, it's like, it's obviously absurd. I also think I would take a different view of, uh, I think a different view if it were a, a pickleball league like facility where people, you know, that was lit and people would be playing into the night and it was constant. I mean, I, I throughout the winter, it's not going to be used <laughs> for that purpose. Um, that's that's several months of the year. Um, I think even when it is used, it, it's it's still going to be a minimal. Uh, it, it, of all the things that this space could be used for, it actually seems to me that football is is, is possibly uh, one of the, the, the less likely. Yeah. Um, Basketball is far more annoying to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to lose three lives that, uh, and the distance 100 feet, 100 feet feet from the resident. I mean, how much noise I have to make to disturb it? And again, it's no time. You know, it's not evening time. I mean, I don't see how there's an impediment for that. <coughs> I've got no issue with it at all. I, I, essentially, it's going where there used to be a playground there for kids. Now it's a playground for adults. And, and uh, I think if the applicant was seemed willing uh, with the plantings, I, I might say maybe a little more robust plantings and make a, a no no permanent lighting a condition, yep. which they seem uh, agreeable to. But I, 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 as a whole, I've got no issue with it at all. George? Nope, nothing there. Okay. Yeah. Um, I agree. I, I don't feel at all comfortable, um, you know, undermining or pushing back against the historical commission's approval. You know, we are not on the historical commission. I don't feel I have that expertise. I, you know, I trust their judgment that they heard the information and they made their decision as well. Um, and the no permanent lighting, I think, is an important condition. Um, with regard to planting, you know, there is a plant list and a quantity um, with proposed sizes. Uh, Mark, do you think that we should, we would want to be more prescriptive, if, or if if the board, you know, I saw the sizes, and in in a, in a few years or maybe several years, those plantings will be of a size that they might offer some sound mm -hmm. deterrence. But as as presented, they're not going to. Right. It, I I don't, but I don't know if the noise is really going to be that much of an issue. It, I don't see this as people are there from nine to five that people are playing. You know, but they're working. I mean, they're employed. So exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. exactly. So I don't know that it's going to be that much of an issue. But uh, it, the, the applicant seemed receptive to enough to uh, to consider the plantings and the fencing and so forth. So if there's a willingness there, then we might have uh, as as kind of a nod toward mm -hmm. abutters who are several hundred feet away that uh, maybe a little taller plantings. So right now it's Steed's Holly, four to five feet in height, dogwood, two to two and a half caliper inches, and a flowering pear, two to two and a half caliper inches, and two of those trees, and then 15 of the holly. So we would want to see six feet, six foot, 
I mean, that, yeah, I mean the no trees are the, those are fine. The, the size of the trees are fine. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, those all of those plantings are to hide the utilities. Okay. It's not the arbor fence. I think the fence. No, yeah, I mean, it looks on this plant like it's. Oh, I believe your sense is all different. Yeah. No, they they changed it after that was submitted. This is the updated one. So, so then front, what do they have? What do they have in front of the utilities? Uh, there's nothing on this plan in front of the utilities. Just lawn area. There, there's no, uh, I mean, I don't see, on the, I don't know if the applicant wants to clarify, but the whole court essentially is in front of the utilities. So right. you're not going to see So the, the utilities wouldn't be well, visible from... Not necessarily. The utilities are outside of it. The dumpster is outside of it. The utilities are kind of on the side, right, away from it. <coughs> right, but if you were if you were down here, and right, the fence the, is here. Right, but the abutters are over here. There's abutters kind of here on this side, and and, I, and still it's pretty far away from the yeah. abutters. Yeah. Um, but I I just think those utilities we would have normally asked for them to be shielded. Either I think they are, they're required to be shielded because of this formal permission yeah. Okay, oh, so we're not even, that's not before us. Well, yes. We have an opportunity, they, I think. But anytime they come before us, everything is kind of before us. I just want, there's nothing noted <coughs> on the plans or on the utilities, so I, I just think if the historical commission said something to seal those. There are, they'll have to comply with the plans that were approved by the historical commission for the addition of those. Um, utility um, boxes there, and then the the there are two properties actually. The one the butter you heard from is more towards the front of the property. Right. There's another structure, the former infirmary, is in right. the back. Right. Um, so that the ball, the court area, is sort of at an angle, blocking those um, utility. So all to say that the historical commission has or would weigh in on the screening for the they already did. They already did. Yeah. So they already So what plan is filed that says that um, it would be screened? Usually that's a plan that comes before us, have, right? Now. I think they didn't they were focusing on just the plantings for the court. So right. that's why they're not on here. But so what do we use as as a plan to verify that there will be plantings there. What does the city use? Um, this plan and any conditions that the historical commission require. Right. So they're trumping us, the historical commission, in this situation. I'm, I'm just trying to clarify. I'm not trying to be a pain in the butt. I'm just trying to clarify that so at some point in time, the city can go back to the builder who has all the best intentions in the world and say, Whoops, there's no plantings here, and this plan said that it's going to be plantings. It's because the, so the reason in this case was because there were some elements that were visible from the street. Okay. So that's what triggered the historical okay. review. So the screening associated with these courts would, would be a barrier in between the street yeah. and the yeah. utilities, right. so they would not be visible from right. the street at that point. So effectively, this, these plantings would serve as screening from the public way of these utilities. And from the environment of those utilities. Uh -huh. So when the planning board looked at this back two years ago, we probably didn't condition any screening of these utilities. Because they weren't shown on the plans. Oh, they weren't there. They can hear so just to close the loop on planting? Yeah, so the trees have no issue with it with um, and so there are four to five foot um, holly bushes and I'm so I'm thinking maybe just six foot, six to eight foot, something like that. I don't know if yeah, that's if that's even an issue. Yeah. Well the other thing to consider is you know the older they are, the harder they are to transplant and survive. So um, I don't know personally about that species and what the maximum recommended size is upon planting. 
So if you felt like, I mean, alternatively, if you felt like it wasn't screening, maybe there could be some offset. So a second row that's in the gaps between the first row, mm -hmm. but at the same height, um, just to avoid maybe uh, creating a, um, a condition that requires a size that wouldn't be so successful. Upon so maybe something like that on the side facing the butter or um, on both sides. One thing I'm looking at the plan, there is a, a, a small retaining wall, mm -hmm. but that, so the, at that, at that turn, at those, where the plantings are, the court will be sunk a little bit, which means the plants will be up that much oh, higher. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's not so much of an issue unless you stagger them, like Carolyn was saying, and had kind of two rows or a row and a half. Um, Around the corner. I mean, they do, they will have to come back anyway they could do a, another run if you all agree that that's a good idea to have another row of plantings maybe staggered they can come and show you that well, as alan just mentioned they're buttoned right up now against the retention pond so they may not be able to squeeze right. that in right. yeah. 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 i mean there would be or a red guard you know on that the lower <coughs> portion between here but pro yeah probably not along here um, so what are we thinking? So uh, it might be just back? something, if, 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 if the hearing is going to be continued, so the applicant knows that the, the lighting would be a condition and mm -hmm. it might be, the, the painting might be something that they want to look at again to see if they can be approved upon in the manner which we spoke and, you know, just to take a look at it. I mean, I feel comfortable with that. We've got into all yeah. these. Seems kind of vague. I'm, I'm comfortable approving it the way it is. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't they, can't, they can't do anything. I think the lighting on the wall. The lighting being like sense. And the gate, yeah. you know, it just doesn't seem like an unattractive you know, thing. Uh, well, another thing is, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that. I don't. I don't know that we have evidence that that another row of planting would make a meaningful right. difference. Right. 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 Yeah. Anyway. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I would be comfortable with the planting as it is. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's fine. Um, and then the one condition of you know, permanent lighting. Right. So, are we? So we're holding off on a motion. We're just continuing, or are yeah, we, you would need to continue light. because you can't close the right. hearing. Okay. Um, so, so it would be the no permanent lighting on the courts and the revised and approved stormwater permit. But we're allowing the uh, the. Uh, retention wall to move. The stairs. The stairs to be removed. Pending yeah. approval of the revised stormwater permit. Okay. Is there any point in voting on the whole thing but not closing the meeting? Just so we don't have to mm -hmm. go over it over? Go over I don't there. think we can vote until we close. We'd have to close public comment, which we can't do. But you right. could say that you're satisfied w with what's there and mm -hmm. you're just waiting for the stormwater in the event that the stormwater changes anything so right. you can certainly say hey, have, we just, have i just said that yeah okay i mean, I mean are we all, do we need to take a vote on that you don't need to take a vote mm -hmm. okay so we are in agreement that we are comfortable with the retaining wall this removal of the steps pending approval of the revised stormwater permit and installation of the pickleball courts with a condition that there be no should, should we on say our... um athletic court yes to not yes. restrict it yeah. yes the athletic court which may be used for a variety of and there is a public hearing scheduled for um, 7 p.m. on September 26th. It's for a minor um, zoning amendment, so maybe you want to continue it to 7.15 on the 26th. 7.15, folks are comfortable. Uh, is there a motion to continue this, uh, continue this, this site plan amendment to September 26th at 7.15 p.m.? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, can we, is it possible I felt like we've approved things with the notion and approved it and allowed you guys, your staff, staff to actually make this decision assuming the stormwater is fine. Um, everything but because this is in a stormwater permit um, review, there, it's specific okay. to that ordinance that no other permits can be issued mm -hmm. until that's issued. Okay. So just to be clear, we're not giving them informal okay to do anything at the pickleball site yet. We're giving them informal okay to work on the 
No, no. That's that's the, like, the steps. We're doing that only on the steps. Yes. They can't do anything at the pickleball site. Correct. 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 Yeah, because that's from so, so we have a motion. I'll make a motion for a continuation of site plan amendment uh, for 1924 LLC, former Clark School, to remove steps and accessory pickleball court from 40 to 54 Round Hill Road, North Hampton Map ID 31E-4 to September 26th at 715. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank I didn't see you were in class. Um, thank you. So we are continued. Uh, again, as a reminder, as with all of our continued hearings, we are uh, unable to discuss the open matter uh, in the interim intervening weeks. So if you see us in the grocery store and run into us, um, the public hearing is still open. So we won't be able to make any comments about it until we come back on the 26th. Thank you. Um, we do have some additional business on the board. Um, you are welcome to stay. But we do have thank you. Uh, we'll open up the 845 hearing for major site plan for 34,000 square feet of new mixed commercial buildings with drive through and road site developments. A special permit for more than one curb cut at 301 and 303 King Street. Our family map ID is 24C 70, 71, and 81. Um, there has been a request from the applicant that we continue that hearing also to October 10th. Right, and um, we can do that at 7 p.m. And at 7 p.m. So Julie would be at 8 p.m. and this would be at 7 p.m. Any comments? Did someone make a motion? So moved. Second. Where's the second? All those in favor? Yeah. Anyone opposed? And again, a reminder that since we are continuing that, somebody decides to, they want to start chatting you up about King Street Developments, hold your tongue. <laughs> See you next month. Uh, do we have any other business? Only the grocery store that I can talk about. Only at the grocery store, yes. Yeah. Is there is there another motion though? Sam, you want a motion? Can we open the public hearing? Yes, and continue it. Okay. Why do we open the public hearing if there's no last good chair? They were already have to open it to continue. We do have to. I I I move to close the meeting. Second. Second. All those in favor of the fifth. <laughs>